Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome. Um, my name is Netta Kornberg. I am the Knowledge Exchange Lead with the Ontario Harm Reduction Network. Uh, and we are here today to celebrate the launch of Connecting, a guide to using harm reduction supplies as engagement tools and to explore some concrete ways that it can be used. All right, so um, everybody who's here, if you wanna introduce yourselves, that would be fantastic. Uh, you can put in the chat box uh, your name and your agency. And um, if you have any questions, you can really even start answering them now or asking them now. So over the next hour, uh, we're gonna be hearing from a number of speakers, people who were involved in creating the guide, uh, and folks have been using it since it came out. And we'll also have a Q&A. So again, uh, you can put those questions uh, for the panelists in the Q&A box. So we have quite a few speakers, but even uh, with all these speakers, we're not really representative of the diversity of the province and the agencies who would use this guide, the people who work at these agencies, the diversity of clients served, the different regions, uh, all the different contexts where this guide could be used. But we are going to hear from a number of different perspectives and I think from some pretty excellent people. So we only have an hour and let's get started. So we're going to start with our uh, land acknowledgement. This is um, the land acknowledgement of the Ontario Harm Reduction Network. Uh, it's a work in progress always. If you have uh, feedback or thoughts, please get in touch with us. So Orrin's offices are located on what is known by many today as Toronto, the traditional territories of several indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. But our work takes place across Ontario, which includes the ancestral and current homes of numerous and diverse indigenous peoples. Harm reduction is grounded in place, the specific context of the specific areas where we each work. We recognize these contexts are fundamentally shaped by the historic and contemporary presence and activities of Indigenous peoples. And these contexts are also influenced by colonial, racist, and classist drug laws and policies. While those of us working in harm reduction support individual people who use drugs and their communities, we must also address and change the unjust systems that continue to negatively and disproportionately affect Indigenous people who have been living on this land since time immemorial. So I'm going to ask Karen Lomax uh, to um, uh, speak first. Karen is the Overdose Prevention Coordinator um, at Arch Guelph, uh, and she's got a message of congratulations. Oh, good morning out there in Zoom land. I guess 118 people are here. That's amazing. So first off, I'd like to start um, and say congratulations to this book. Um, I can't help but say, excuse, excuse my language, but it's a kick-ass book. I've got nothing but amazing feedback from folks that have seen it, used it, and so on and so forth. Um, the process itself was amazing. Um, we all got together via phone. Of course, uh, you know, we're all over the province, but everybody's voice was heard, which was amazing. One of the main things of the manual that I thought was very important was for it to be user friendly right across the board from nurses to uh, the folks that are trained in the medical field, right down to somebody that's never seen a cooker. I think they have totally captured that. Um, so very, very pleased. It's an excellent book. Um, we incorporated um, in the when we're using the manual, another point that I thought was really important was the fact that um, we incorporated how folks on the streets were using some of the products and how to teach them how to use it, how's, how to use the our products in a harm reduction sense or in conjunction. And I think we've embraced that also mentioned, and I'm typically talking about the crack pipes with Brillo. We know folks use Brillo, but I love how that we gave an option how to get around that how to do it safely if you have to go that route so i think i think that was brilliant and uh it, it captured what it needed to uh, that's one of the hiccups that i've had training in the harm reduction is how to use the products and how to use them uh, safely and properly um 
Also, I uh, used the manual to do a mini training just lately. We had the, the mobile rack is coming in here in Guelph, um, going into our northern realm. And we've got, uh, we've got social workers, we've got nurses on there, we've got peers, we've got folks that are, that are familiar with this stuff. We also have folks that are not familiar with the products. And I, I, took the, I took the manual and tried to make a mini manual of um, the most important parts. Well, my first kick at, the, at doing this, I ended up making 60 pages. So it wasn't much of a mini manual. I was trying to figure out what was important, what wasn't, and I just wanted to incorporate all of it. So anyway, we got that done. And what I did was I used the manual just, just like the pictures had shown and trained folks how to fill the water, up, how to fill the cooker up with the water how to use the filter, da, 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 just like the book showed. And they, uh, that's the best reviews I've got back from a training in a long time. So I can't help but say that, you know, it, it, it was amazing. And the book captured that. Also uh, forwarded the book once it first came out to a couple of the nurses down at the CTS. Of course, they're familiar with the medical side of things and so on and so forth. The feedback I got from them was the tips and the tricks that were in there. Were, were just absolutely amazing. They learned so much. And on my last note, I'd like to say that I've had so many agencies come, how do I get five manuals for my agency? I want to buy them. They're just amazing. So I think we did an okay job. Um, so congratulations to everybody that was on board and I hope everybody enjoys it. And that's me from Guelph. Thank you so much. Uh, so next up, um, I'm going to introduce Nadia, but first just a reminder that uh, folks uh, to use the chat box if you want to send a message, uh, kind of general message to everyone, um, and to use the Q&A box uh, if you want to uh, direct a question to the speakers that can be answered during the uh, Q&A section. So Nadia is the manager of the Ontario Harm Reduction Distribution Program, and she's going to be giving us a project overview. Take it away. Morning, everyone. Thanks, Nada. Uh, and thanks, Karen, for uh, really, really wonderful words to hear. Um, you are a big support um, and contributor on the advisory committee. I've got uh, the dubious task of giving an overview of this project, how and why it began, and it wasn't until I started reflecting on when this started that I realized that well, it started a few years ago, um, but how very fortunate we were um, to embark on this because it's been an incredible journey. Um, initial discussions about this project began in 2017 um, as various stakeholders who support the work of harm reduction agencies wanted to understand why harm reduction agencies um, may not be in a position to adopt or practice some of the best practice recommendations as they are um, written in the um, best practice recommendations for harm reduction programs fondly referred to as the BPRs. Now the BPRs are a wonderful resource and have been foundational for many programs and uh, service delivery model development and for development of policies. But the BPRs themselves, are not the most ideal um, in helping frontline workers with practical tips to support the people that they support. OHRDP and ORN have had a long working relationship, but this project um, really pushed us to formalize our collaborative nature. And it's, this project is really a wonderful intersection of the two programs um, and in our efforts to really support the amazing work that all of you do on an everyday basis. Um, with the encouragement and support of the AIDS and Hepatitis C programs, um, ORN and OHRDP submitted a letter of intent to the Public Health Agency of Canada, and we were able to secure two-year funding. With the funds, we um, were able to hire a project coordinator who was Miroslav Miskovic, whose now um, project is over, so he's not with us any longer. But Miroslav brought a great deal of knowledge and quirkiness to this project. So anyone who had any dealings with, with Miroslav will understand that comment. Um, one of Miroslav's first tasks was to establish um, an advisory committee and ensuring that you know, there was representation from right across this province, from big programs, small programs, rural, urban, and he also um, was 
he, he also um, secured um, ethics approval to, for us to ensure that we could proceed with this project in the best way possible. The advisory committee um, helped guide the work of this project. The experience and expertise of everyone on that committee helped us help to ensure that what we heard at the very beginning of this project through the focus groups was respected and it was followed through upon right to the end of the project. They kept us honest. Um, the focus groups provided us with not only the valuable information um, in identifying what frontline staff wanted and needed, um, and that was actually the, the manual that we heard loud and clear that people wanted something that they could refer to that was easy and accessible. It was in plain language and it had pictures or photos that they could use when they're working with um, individuals. The programs that hosted the focus groups for us, you provided us with much more than a venue uh, for the focus groups. You provide by opening up your programs and your communities to us, you gifted us with inspiration and you re-energized us in our commitment to the work. Meeting, gathering the, um, for information and ideas was just the beginning. Um, the hard work was yet to come and our sleeves had to be rolled up and that was um, the creation of, of, of a tool. It, we had a, a literature review was conducted and there was an evaluation um, component to this project. With the evaluation, we're really fortunate to collaborate with Dr. Carol Strike, the principal author of the BPRs. She not only helped us with the evaluation, um, but she was there every step of the way throughout the project lifespan. She was always a phone call away, and that was really helpful. The final product, this, the, the guide itself, it's not, it's not perfect, but we're very proud of it, and we certainly have learned a lot of things along the way. Um, what we're hoping for, then in a year's time, we hear from people and we see pictures from you of that guide being well loved and used. They're, the corners are frayed, pictures are fold, pages are folded. Um, please don't hesitate to send us pictures of really used products. That that will be an indicator for us that we we, we got it right um, and that this did fill a gap. Um, that's all I had to say. It was a really quick overview and probably not what everybody wants to hear. We want to get on to hearing on how the, how people have been using this guide. I'm going to turn the, so to speak, mic over to Denise. Um, and Denise accompanied Miroslav to all of the focus groups. And Denise was extremely instrumental um, in making sure that this project and the guide got completed. So Denise, from all of us, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Netta. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and yeah, without further ado, let's uh, go to Denise. I am going to just uh, start sharing my screen again. Um, and also, again, just a reminder to everyone um, to use the chat box to send messages to everyone. You might need to make sure that the um, uh, where it says two and you have a bunch of options, that it's actually to all panelists and audience. Um, uh, rather than just to all panelists, because I think some folks have been uh, uh, sending it to us. We love to hear it, but I think everybody else would love to hear from you as well. And to use the Q&A box uh, to um, ask questions to the panelists that would be uh, asked during the Q&A section. So without further ado, uh, Denise, uh, who is the inventory analyst at the Ontario Harm Reduction Distribution Program. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Netta, and thank you, Nadia, for those kind words. Um, so what I want to talk about are the focus groups. And Netta, you can go to the next slide. Um, the focus groups and the information gathered through them are really the pillars of the connecting guide. So we constantly went back to feedback that we received from focus groups over and over again. And that was really to ensure that we were keeping true to what the frontline staff said that they needed in a resource. So this guide was really designed for them to support their day-to-day -day work. Uh, Miroslav and I traveled to eight different destinations and we held two focus groups in each destination. One was for the frontline staff and a separate one was with clients only. And I do need to amend that in the case of London, where they had amazing participation by staff, we held two staff focus groups. So um, what I've identified, identified on this slide is that we had eight groups with frontline staff. It's really nine, but it was in one destination that we had two. 
Um, so London is a very zealous lot and we love them for it. Uh, and we were thrilled that we were able to really get um, a, a good amount of staff from there to participate. So the sites that we visited are Brockville, Cornwall, Guelph, Kenora, Kingston, London, Owen Sound, and Toronto. So for a total of 58 frontline staff, what happened? Sorry about that. Sorry about my loss my screen there for a minute. I thought it was my DSL in the country. So we are good. Um, so for a total of 58 frontline staff and 60 clients total. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Netta, thanks. So I want to talk about some of the things that we learned. Uh, first is we gained insight into how harm reduction supplies are ordered through OHRDP and distributed. So being on the other end uh, in uh, OHRDP, we don't always see the factors that cause differences in your ordering, uh, which has everything to do with drugs and trends in each region. We also really appreciated programs who showed us their storage spaces, which really helped us to see some of the challenges um, on your end and what you're dealing with. Some areas have very minimal space, some have larger areas, and that really impacts uh, ordering and how much you can order at one time so that you can store it for your satellite. So that was really, really helpful. On top of your day-to-day -day work with clients, we know that you are also dealing with significant community issues. So uh, that was very beneficial. Uh, another point is that the best practice recommendations for harm reduction programs, as everybody affectionately calls the BPRs, plays an important role in service planning and distribution of supplies and education. However, the BPRs in its manual form is not easily accessible for frontline workers to quickly access information. We heard clearly that the majority of staff would prefer to have harm reduction content provided in a condensed, easy to access format that's usable for frontline work and in a format that someone could easily turn to show clients with illustrations and step-by-step. We learned that client population can not only be different from region to region, but in different towns within a region. Um, and because of this reality, it requires that frontline staff be familiar with a wide range of harm reduction strategies um, and addressing a wide range of needs. Harm reduction sites cover large geographical areas, which can create barriers to sharing harm reduction knowledge, reaching remote areas, and ensuring uninterrupted access to supplies. Uh, there's a real variance in staffing models uh, from peer run sites, sites with only public health nurses uh, and mixed staff sites. So from site to site, staffing of harm reduction programs is different. Staff have different backgrounds and experience in harm reduction. And this impacts how those sites operate, their policies and procedures, the level of client engagement and the knowledge transfer that's happening. The scope of harm reduction services varies from site to site. So from sites that only distribute supplies to sites providing a range of harm reduction services, some sites are well connected and share knowledge with other harm reduction sites in the region, while some remote areas operate in isolation, lacking supports that some urban programs have. Harm reduction training for new frontline staff in the majority of places is very informal. Um, with a large reliance on job shadowing and word of mouth. Uh, so the scope of harm reduction education is dependent very much on the structure of internal site specific training and the processes that they have in place. So to ensure that educational resources are actually engaging, frontline staff uh, identified characteristics that they felt were useful um, and that resources should really encompass these things. They felt they should be structured, it should be very structured, short and straightforward, written in plain language, so it can be accessible for both staff and for clients. They need to be easily accessed, available both online, uh, so you could use a phone, for example, on the spot if you're out doing outreach, but also available in print, so if someone comes into a harm reduction room, you could easily pull that, open it to a page, and share that information with clients. Um, and people felt that different types of tools should be combined within one resource. 
So the most, the three most requested formats for educational resources that frontline workers said they would prefer are reference guides, short videos, and webinars. And I want to just touch briefly upon the client focus groups. Um, they really helped to reinforce uh, some of the messaging that we received from the staff. Feedback we were seeing from clients around supplies included we were learning about the different places and sources that individuals obtain their supplies. How do they dispose of their supplies? Do folks pick up supplies for others at the same time? How stocked up do they like to be? Uh, enough for a day, a couple days, a week, more? Uh, so I do want to share just one incredibly profound comment that we received from a client during a discussion about kits. And the gentleman said, kits are more for people without a home. Individual supplies are more for people with a home. So in the generosity and sharing and the feedback we receive from both clients and staff, these, this is the foundation that we have built uh, the connecting guide on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, a reminder just before we move on to put uh, kind of general comments uh, into the chat box um, and to make sure that it's going to all panelists and attendees. Uh, and for folks who came late, you can introduce yourself. Um, and if you have questions that you'd like the panelists to answer during the Q&A section to put it in the Q&A box. So next we're gonna hear from Jose Conway, who is the operations coordinator at the Ontario Harm Reduction Distribution Program. Hi, everyone. Um, so it's great to follow up on uh, Denise because format and components and structure is really my keywords here. Um, so we can move to my first slide, uh, Netta, if you don't mind. I have a few slides to show. Um, I'm not going to make this completely boring for you guys, so I'll have some visual elements here. After completing our focus groups, thanks to Denise and Miroslav, um, and Denise expressed that so well, uh, we originally considered that the best structure for this guide would be more conducive through specific drugs, but after conversations with the advisory committee members, it became clear that a focus on supplies would be more useful. So from there, we determined that a mixed approach would be more conducive to sharing information um, in, in the great scheme of things because um, there is value in some repetition to make things easier for everyone to find the information in the first place. So we very inten intentionally offer duplication of content in this book uh, amongst the different sections with the aim to avoid having to flip from one page to the other or, or back and forth. Uh, moving on to the, my second slide here, um, there's nothing worse than having, you know, looking for information and trying to find something and not being able to put your finger on it. So for that reason, we really spent time um, building up an index which would allow you for quick search, um, as well as providing some additional links if you're interested in reading more about the subject. Um, on to the next slide. When we conceptualize the design and development of this guide, it was really important for us to structure it in a way that would be interactive. We wanted to keep it straightforward, clear, and user-friendly. And so to make the content more digestible, we offered a variety of ways to share messages. So key messages for each section, best practices recommendations, methods of using drugs with supplies, and some step-by-step -step resources. For those that don't like reading, we thought that having tips and sample scripts would be a valuable way to share information in a concise but still interesting way. It was important for us to get the wording right so that it would be a helpful conversation starter or even inspire some discussions. Um, we do realize that real life conversations are not so rigidly structured. So essentially uh, we wanted individuals, we wanted people to use this book to feel comfortable reformulating this in their own words while keeping the essence of the message. Um, and to this, the advisory committee was very use, very, very helpful um, to moving us in the right direction and getting the wording right. We included many illustrations because we felt that often an image is worth a thousand words. 
we spent as much time conceptualizing, imagining, and designing these illustrations as we did for the text. Everything was weighted in balance, and we consulted with key groups through the advisory committee. Um, we wanted the, the illustrations to be representative of the realities, um, but mostly to reduce stigma um, and to identify the, the human dignity of, of harm reduction. It was important that the guide uh, be able to reach those new harm reduction staff, as well as seasoned employees. Um, even if some of the information was not new, we hope that it could be a good refresher or could offer a different approach or perspective um, to ensure that they really represent reality. And to that, Karen um, identified some really cool information of how it's been used so far um, in, the, in the very short month and a half that it's been circulated. Um, so my next slide, nothing was left to luck. We reached out to 16 different harm reduction programs in the evaluation phase um, to go through the drafted guide. Um, we call that beta testing. Um, and this allowed us to develop an additional two sections in the resources. So that includes disposal of used harm reduction supplies, as well as the risk associated with using alternate items for injecting smoking drugs. Um, and it also resulted in two additional illustrations. Um, so this evaluation and beta testing of the tool of the guide was really, really useful. So overall, the five sections, um, safer injecting, safer inhaling, safer swallowing and snorting, overdoses and resources, offered a thorough view of how supplies are um, more than supplies and that they are truly an engagement tool. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jose. Um, so if anybody has questions uh, about that or anything else that you've heard uh, that you wanna ask the panelists, please uh, put that into the Q&A box. And if you have a sort of general uh, comments or messages or anything, you can use the chat box and just make sure it's going to all panelists uh, and attendees. Uh, so next we're going to talk about some uh, practical ways uh, that the um, bit to use the guide. I'll give a bit of an overview and then we're going to hear from Megan and Talia. Megan Hicks is a case management and outreach registered nurse with addictions and mental health services at KFLNA Public Health in Kingston. And Talia Storm is the manager of street work services at Positive Living Niagara. So this guide, we've been talking about it sort of as uh, one thing, uh, but there's actually a few different kind of um, uh, ways to package it, a few different kinds of materials that are involved. Uh, so you've got the full guide, both in print version and in digital version, um, and all the digital um, material can be found at orn.org slash connecting. Um, and you've also got uh, the option to engage with the guide in sections. So Jose was saying that um, they made sure to repeat key information throughout the guide, which means that each section is sort of standalone if you need it. And then there are also posters that are available and those are available for download um, at orn.org slash connecting as well. And we sort of imagine that there are a few different ways uh, or a few different settings where it can be used uh, in training, uh, during work, but uh, sort of in the building, as well as when working in the field during doing outreach. And I think it's a kind of a mix and match between the materials and the settings and finding that right, that right match. So for training, for example, you might wanna use portions of the printed guide depending on what the training is about. Uh, or you might wanna go through the full guide with the folks that you're training, maybe using the digital version of it. In the building or in the different buildings and doors where you work, maybe having posters up uh, and some copies of the full printed guide available where everybody knows where it is, it's easily accessible, folks can grab it as needed. And in the field when doing outreach, Maybe outreach workers want to have the digital version bookmarked or downloaded uh, on your phone. So I think it's really about using the material that's right for the setting and the use, uh, and that can be really flexible and fluid. And again, you can find all the digital material um, at orn.org slash connecting. 
So now I'm going to pass it over to uh, Megan. Uh, and uh, after that, going right to Talia. So Megan, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, can everyone see me? Okay, perfect, right on. I was wasn't sure because I couldn't see myself on the screen. Um, so I'm Megan, I'm one of the nurses uh, through Addiction Mental Health Services here in Kingston. Uh, I just wanted to make one correction um, just from my intro. Um, I'm working with Addiction Health, uh, Mental Health Services within uh, K uh, KFLA region, but I don't work for public health. Um, I, we have partnerships with public health, but I'm not necessarily working uh, for them. So just FYI. <laughs> um, so my background is, and what I'm doing here at AMHS is I'm uh, facilitating, um, helping the intensive case management team. Um, I'm wearing a few hats right now, just especially because of the pandemic, doing some uh, specific uh, kind of COVID outreach and also working at the Kingston Self-Isolation Center. So meeting a lot of folks that I actually haven't um, engaged with yet in the city. So that's been pretty interesting. Um, my background, um, I spent a lot of time out in Calgary in, my, uh, in a previous life <laughs> um, where I did a lot of harm reduction um, distribution um, uh, or distribution of products uh, through a program called SafeWorks where we drove around in a van and handed out supplies and did teaching and did SGI, BBI testing. Um, also worked in a supervised consumption site up there for a number of years. Um, so and then coming to Kingston and doing some outreach services here. So I have um, a decent background with regards to harm reduction teaching and showing folks how to use um, equipment safely. However, I did find this guide super, super, super helpful. So even if you feel like you kind of know it all and it's not gonna be something for you, like I've actually been using it in my practice recently and it's been super, super helpful. So, um, and I think for a new user too, it would be super helpful. So just to kind of talk about a couple of ways about the, um, the a couple of ways that I've used it recently. Um, so usually when I engage with folks, I mean, you're not gonna get anywhere with them and everybody here that's engages with the, a lot of our, the folks that we uh, traditionally deal with. Um, I mean, you're not gonna get anywhere without building up your therapeutic relationship first. People aren't going to, um, people aren't gonna be, aren't gonna to wanna to talk about their drug use. It's very personal, unless you kind of have a bit of a connection with them. So establishing that relationship, I mean, outreach is key to that. So usually what I would do is if a person wants to, wants to have a, engage in a conversation with me is I sit down, kind of ask them how do they use, what they usually use, and then from there kind of grab like the actual supplies, the kit, whatever they're, you're using, and I get them to show me how they use it. Um, if you're lucky enough to work in a supervised consumption site or a, a, um, like a consumption treatment space, um, if, they're, if the person really trusts you can actually see how they prepare it there or sometimes I just get them to grab the supplies and say like look if you're going to do your uh, get your your uh, dose ready here how would you do it um, that kind of negates having to go over information that they already know if they look if they're doing most things uh, correctly I'm not stepping on stepping on any toes I'm just kind of offering tips if um, if they're willing to accept them offering tips um, if I see anything that could maybe potentially be worked on or they maybe they could use a little bit more inf information in that area. Having said that, though, this this uh, guide has been super, super helpful because I find sometimes I'm, I'm kind of chatty and I get distracted. And anybody who knows me, there's a couple of folks on here that know me. Um, they probably realize that. <laughs> but I like turning to so say if I was going to do some teaching with regards to smoking crystal meth, um, I turn to that page and then on the side, there's the key messages right on the side. I like to have the key messages out while I'm doing my teaching because it kind of just reminds me, like as we're chatting, um, sometimes that maybe I'll forget to say, for example, um, like to avoid using a loan, especially during the pandemic, right? So we're chatting, I'm going through the, I'm going through my, my teaching and I'm, I'm basically like in my mind, I'm kind of like glancing back to the guide, taking off like, okay, I said that, I said that, I said that, I said that. Um, but um, yeah, it just kind of keeps me on track and I really, I really appreciate that. Um, the other thing I wanted to speak to is, um, especially since the pandemic here in Kingston, we don't have a lot of providers that are um, providing um, safe supply with regards to oral dilaudid. Um, that's something that's new to me in my practice. I know a bunch of you guys in uh, across Ontario, across like across Canada, that might not be so new to you. But this is something that's new to me, and it's new to me since the pandemic started because we have some folks that are coming into town um, from places that they're prescribing safe supplies, so they already have their scripts of oral dilaudid, um, and then they might be using that for injection. So 
and not to bring up a discussion about that or anything, because I know that's that's kind of a heated topic right now. But um, we have so in, in my practice trying to help these people use it as safely as possible. If uh, that was to come up, um, I found this section very very uh, helpful. But like I said, because I'm quite naive to this practice of injecting um, actual prescription um, opioids, I'm used to more so the illicit. Used to used to be folks using more so the illicit uh, type of drugs. So, um, I mean, so when I'm doing that teaching now, I just flip to that section in the book and uh, away we go. So just, and especially highlighting the, the importance of um, just making sure they know um, that the, there's some serious side effects as associated with injecting the oral, um, uh, like high, especially hydromorph or dilaudid or whatever. Um, last but not least, the one last thing I wanted to share with you guys was recently I did some teaching um, with a group of folks um, that were living in one kind of a congregate living setting. Um, and the, the most, a lot of them had some cognitive impairment or there were some developmental delays um, in with the folks that were living in this community center. And uh, so I had to modify my teaching quite a bit. Like I usually kind of have a dialogue. I'll say the same thing over and over again. Again, nice to have the reference, but um, I found having to modify it so much more so than I would usually be um, doing. Um, just to meet the client's needs, the, the client's learning needs. It was so helpful to have the guide because it was, I just, um, I was, I was turning to a lot of pictures. I was um, making sure that I, I, I said all my key messages. So turning to those key message pages that are always on the right. Um, the two photographs that I really um, felt helpful, that were very helpful with these folks. And this picture has been done a million times. Like I've seen this picture like online a bunch. But this one's done really well. I appreciate the colors, like the, the red means, you know, the red means stop, the green means go. Um, the yellow is kind of like a kind of hesitant area, but okay. Um, so it was super, super helpful. The other photograph that I really, really enjoyed and clients really enjoyed was um, the pictures of the needle tips after they've been used for a few times. So, um, and this was especially uh, important with the, some of the folks that I was, like I said, I was, I was um, that had some um, learning uh, challenges. So this was really great. The photograph that's kind of shows after a needle that's been used a few times um, that becomes like quite barbed after use. So um, just encouraging folks to use that needle like as a single use tool. Anyway, um, what others, the last thing I wanted to say is everybody that I've shared this guide with, um, I've shared the link a million times now um, with a lot of community partners here. Um, and the one thing that everybody keeps asking for is hard copies. So if we could get more hard copies, I would be very appreciative um, whether they can be for purchase or whether they can be for, uh, if they can be distributed somehow. Um, but yeah, having the hard copy has been key for me, especially uh, with regards to doing outreach. Um, sometimes I just can't get the internet or sometimes the phone doesn't work. So the, the hard copy has been a, life, uh, um, a game changer. So. Thank you so much. Um, that's all. I'm going to stop now. And uh, thank you so much for this, guys. It's been great, and I'm really happy that it's come um, come to come to light. So I'll sh I'll stop talking. <laughs> thank you. And now we are on to Talia. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone is having a good start to the day. Um, so I am Talia Storm. I'm the manager of Street Work Services here in Niagara. So um, we run a lot of harm reduction programming, including um, case management, van outreach, a lot of Narcan work. Uh, we do have a CTS locally, which is awesome. Um, and this guide is coming in handy. So our team has grown exponentially over the last little while. So it's a really great opportunity for folks who are newer to our team or a little bit new to harm reduction. Um, because the guide is so very detailed. Um, we do have the posters up in our spaces already, so we do have a few uh, permanent locations and we have shared some of the posters with our satellite sites as well. We do have about nine satellite sites throughout the region and so we have shared this information um, with them. Some feedback about the guide itself. We are really loving the um, try this line section um, of the guide, so I have it up here. So there's a lot of um, a lot of conversation starters and things like that that we can really encourage staff to use to, to hit some 
some of those key points. Um, feedback has been very positive about the imagery in the guide. Um, some folks have said, hey, I see myself in these pictures. Um, so that has been really encouraging, even down to, hey, that's the right lighter. Um, so excellent work on that. And I, and I, um, I think it helps that people can see themselves in it. It's an accessible guide in that way. Um, we are going to be incorporating um, a lot of that into the presentations that we do. Generally, right now, it's with other service providers um, and in community. Um, and so uh, the imagery and the messaging um, suits those presentations very, very well. Um, our outreach fans have found the guide pretty handy. Um, so they are out in community and Megan, I know you mentioned we don't always have access to internet or to, um, to websites to download guides while we're out there. Um, and so they're able to flip uh, within those books pretty quickly. And I know um, our van crew has um, copied some pieces of the book to give to folks when they have specific questions. So um, one incident comes to mind where uh, someone wasn't sure about the different steps for injection and specifically around um, the use of water. Uh, and so we were able to take pieces of this guide and really go step by step through things with her. Um, so that has been wonderful. The, one of the key things that I wanted to touch on though is how we're using this externally. Um, so we are always working with other service providers and currently a lot of our work is um, in partnership with the shelter system. So we do have many shelters here in Niagara and a lot of them are trying to adopt a more harm reduction based approach to service, uh, which we are very eager and happy about. So this has really helped um, in distribution like we've shared the, the PDF link with them so that they can share with their staff so they can continue to build their own knowledge around harm reduction with support from, from our team. Um, we uh, This has come up quite a few times. We've had a lot of folks mention that they would like to purchase the guide. Um, and so having that available, um, we've talked about the benefit of a hard copy. I think that would be huge. Um, so yeah, our focus, um, not only using it internally, but also really getting it in the hands of other service providers who are starting to focus a little bit more on harm reduction to build that capacity as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Talia, and thank you everybody who's spoken so far. Um, I'm actually going to ask all the panelists now to uh, turn on your videos. Um, and I just want to check in uh, before we go to the Q&A and see if there's anybody, uh, any of the panelists want to just like add anything at this point, particularly around uh, the use of the guide or the story behind it. Um, any comments before we go to the Q&A? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Denise now to sort of field uh, the questions that we've, uh, that we've gotten. Um, and yeah, if uh, everybody could turn on uh, your video if possible and uh, let's keep ourselves on mute unless we are responding just for background noise reasons awesome thank you so i'm going to denise you're on mute now thank you um uh some of the questions i answered within the chat within the uh, q a but there are some that i think are really helpful if we talk about uh, uh, with the full group um the biggest question we're being asked which is awesome um is uh, are is that people are wondering if there are more guides available if people can purchase them um and so that's fantastic um our distribution uh we only had so many printed um, and under our grant, of course, um, and we distributed about 635 to, within the harm reduction network in Ontario. So uh, we do not have a lot left over. Um, but what we are asking people to do is to please contact uh, uh, ORN or OHRDP and please let us know of your interest, kind of what you would be looking at in terms of copies that you would be that you would like. That would be really helpful for us to know we're keeping track of of all of that um and of course it is available free for download uh at the orn um website so please use that um and we're excited that you want more in all honesty uh but sorry we don't have more just to be able to get, give you at the moment 
Uh, Caitlin, thank you, Caitlin, for uh, asking the question. Uh, she asked if there's a modified presentation created that summarizes the guide and how to use it as an engagement tool. I'm thinking this sort of condensed presentation may be useful when training new staff in needle syringe programs, when educating the general public and community partners on harm reduction supplies. And that's an awesome suggestion um, and one that uh, we'll take back to the group. And while I can't commit for others, I think I can say this makes tons of sense um, and uh, completely doable on our part. So, uh, so we'll put our heads together and we will um, look at creating something that would be uh, uh, kind of an offshoot of this. Um, may I please have a copy of the slides of the presentation was asked a number of times and Netta has said, yes, we can make that available. So, so that will be coming uh, your way. Um, and a really important one about noticing some pictures on the digital download book um, block in the written material, uh, in particular pages, um, that they're covering some of the wording. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we don't know that unless, unless that information comes back to us. Um, if anyone is having that uh, issue, I would first um, just recommend that maybe just to test and see if you need an Adobe update because it's PDF. Sometimes that fixes that kind of an issue. Um, and if not, uh, we will take that back. We'll, we'll print out a full copy ourselves and kind of see what we're looking at and if there's more. So thank you for that. Um, and Ara was wondering if there are any supply ordering guides. Each type of supply comes in different units. I find that we end up, end up loaded with too many of one supply and not enough of another. Has there been any guidance about how many of each unit to order um, and so on? So uh, lucky for you, Ara, we created a, a product supply guide uh, that is very recent and very new. So it does outline how all supplies come in what, what number of units and the volumes and boxes and bags. So I think that's probably what, um, what you're looking for um, and that's available. If you have access to the OHRDP website, to the portal, um, it is there. And if not, you could obtain it either through your core program or uh, email OHRDP and we can uh, send you that. But it is very helpful for sure. Um, I think those are the main questions. Um, yeah, Denise, if I can speak a little bit to that ordering volume of, of supplies and having an inventory balance. Um, this is a real science um, and honestly, kudos for asking this question. So economic order quantity is a science EOQ. I won't bore you with all of that inventory management practices <laughs> science, um, but Eric, if you're uh, interested in hearing more about it and finding the sweet spot for ordering volumes, um, reach out to us. Honestly, it's something that we can help with. Uh, thanks, Jose. Um, and then we have a question and maybe I could throw this to Nadia. Um, on page 88 and 91, it refers to recapping your own needles before placing them in sharps containers. Um, the individual's understanding of best practice is to never recap your needles and rather immediately place them in a sharps container. Has this changed? I think I'm off mute. Um, thanks, Kim. Well, that was a question that we bantered back and forth for a long time. And um, generally speaking, it is still best for, for individuals if they have a, their own personal bio bin right then and there just to dispose of it. But if it's not necessarily right there in handy, if you are able to recap it and then put it in, that's, um, that is what is the, the, that is what we're now recommending. Um, Talia, uh, Karen, Megan, jump in there anytime and what you tell your clients, but um, generally, the recapping part is where someone could uh, potentially prick themselves is, is, is what I understand to be the issue, but immediately into a bio bin um, is the preference. For our mm -hmm. folks, um, it's, it's the, the recommendation is generally straight into the bio bin, not necessarily with recapping. Um, that's the same, I would say, with me. I mean, if it's your own, if it's your own individual use, it's only you that's using it. I mean, recapping, it's not the end of the world because if you prick yourself, it's just, it's yourself. <laughs> um, there, I mean, there's risk for infection and stuff like that with that, but um, 
if um, if somebody's throwing something into a pop bottle, which you guys address in the book later on, and in the, in the end, if you're throwing stuff into a pop bottle that's not a, a proper container, then yes, I would say maybe cap it first. If it's if it's your own individual use, if it's ever if it's somebody else has used it, no, like just throw it in the pop bottle and hope for the best. But yeah, great, thank you. Um, she'll say, I'm going to throw this question to you um, from Ara, uh, wondering if there are any supply, oh, sorry, wrong one. Ara had another one uh, around, uh, sorry. Uh, there are some of the supplies that we need for kit making within the PNP community. Any chance that these items might become available? So six different color straws, chapstick vials for GHB, plastic cards, syringes without needles for booty bumping, anything that you could offer around ordering those additional kinds of supplies. Hi, thank you for uh, for this question. I think it opens up the, the need to have the conversation a little bit broader with um, with who you receive your supplies from, which would be the public health unit or the core needle syringe program to know what uh, supplementary or complementary supplies they offer above and beyond what OHRDP makes available in terms of harm reduction supplies. Um, and also perhaps a conversation with um, the priority population of um, gay men's sexual health, GMHS. I believe I got the acronym right, um, but I think this is perhaps uh, an opportunity to have a, a broader conversation to really reach this population. Is there uh, any other questions that people have uh, there's there's some in the chat box that i'll just respond to um specifically but um denise if i can just sort of add um, going back a few points about the the number of guides that um were hard copies that were disseminated the original uh funding proposal that we um that we had the finding grant we had a total of about between 60 and 98 guides was with the original um deliverable was and that was counting the 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 audience or the, the the core programs that we support at ohrdp and the 10 membership at the time and uh through some conversations with the lovely folks at phack we rearranged a few things and were able to make funds available to make more copies and little did we know um that by printing more copies, the copies just got that much cheaper. And um, we were actually able to print more than, than what we anticipated. So um, we, we thought we were sitting on quite a large volume and we wondered, oh, are they going to sit on our shelves? But um, apparently the, the number was a little low. Um, so thank you for telling us that um, you'd like more copies. We're, we'll, we'll look into what's available, but for, for now, yeah, it is electronically available. But I just wanted everyone to know, we started off with under 100. <laughs> um, and, and we thought that that would be a hard, hard number to disseminate, so. Uh, so that is all of the questions that I had. So I will pass that back to Netta. Okay, um, and I'm actually just gonna pass it off to Nick, who is the director of the Ontario Harm Reduction Network, um, and he's just gonna, yeah, wrap things up for us. Hey everyone, uh, Nick Boyce here with the Ontario Harm Reduction Network, and uh, thanks, it's great to see so many people on the webinar today. Uh, first, I would just like to acknowledge and thank the people who use drugs who shared their insights and knowledge during the focus groups. Um, this guide is really based on their experiences and wisdom, which should always be centered in any resources, programs, or services uh, that we're developing. Um, Thanks as well to the harm reduction workers who provided feedback, the advisory committee, uh, the awesome team at OHRDP and the leadership of Nadia Zerba, to Miroslav Miskovic, who did the initial research and writing, uh, the, the great design team at One Idea and the Public Health Agency of Canada for funding. Um, second, thank you to Kim for tech support today, Denise and Neda for pulling this webinar together, and thank you to, to Karen, Talia and Megan for joining and sharing your perspectives. 
This is a living and breathing document and it will continue to evolve um, with new insights and experiences. And we really want to hear from you about how it's being used in the community and it will guide future work and other resources we're developing. So please give us some feedback in the fall. Uh, immediately after this webinar, we will send a quick two question um, survey. You'll get that by email. And then in the fall, we'll be uh, making an effort to solicit some more feedback. We're also in the process of reviewing a final French version, translation version, and we will develop that into a graphic version as well. So that will be coming later this summer. Um, and again, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, want copies, get in touch with uh, OHRDP at info at ohrdp.ca. Uh, check out orn.org slash connecting for the digital posters and uh, digital version. And um, thank you, Ms. Yimi Gwich. Uh, thank you to all today. I think that's it, Tim. I think we can end the webinar. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you.